Hello and welcome to today's discussion, which explores what's so great about Lewis Carroll, 150 years since the publication of Through the Looking Glass. I'm Molly Rosenberg, uh, I'm Director of the Royal Society of Literature, and it's my pleasure to open today's conversation in partnership with the British Library. This is the next instalment in our event series on some of the most popular writers of the past and the last event in our winter season. We're really pleased to greet so many of you virtually tonight uh, and particularly glad to be welcoming Leonie Ross as chair. Those of you who booked some time ago will know that Irena Sinekoji was originally billed to chair this evening, um, but unfortunately Irena is unable to join us, passing in us instead into the equally wonderful and capable hands of Leonie. Before I hand over to her uh, to introduce our speakers, Joyce Carol Oates, Patrice Lawrence and Chris Riddell, I have a few notes of housekeeping, which I will try to keep brief, I promise. Um, at the end of the discussion tonight, Leonie, we'll turn to your questions. You can send these through using the box at the bottom of your screen and please send them through as we go uh, and we'll ask as many as we can later on. As you are struck by the inspiration of our speakers, you can buy their books online too through the British Library and I think there's a button uh, at the top right of your screen for that. It is now my very good fortune to properly welcome and introduce the brilliant Leonie Ross. Leonie is a fiction writer. Her first novel, All the Blood is Red, was longlisted for the Orange Prize, and her second novel, Orange Laughter, was chosen as a BBC Radio 4 Women's Hour watershed fiction favourite. Her short fiction has been widely anthologised and her first short story collection, the 2017 Come Let Us Sing Anyway, was nominated for the Edge Hill Short Story Prize, the Jalak Prize, the Saboteur Awards and the OCM Bocas Prize. Her most recent novel, This One Sky Day, which is extraordinary, uh, was shortlisted for this year's Goldsmiths Prize, which celebrates innovative writing. She's taught creative writing for 20 years and is editor of Glimpse, the first black British anthology of speculative fiction due out in 2022 with Pea Paltry Press. Welcome, Fiona. Good evening, everybody. And from me, your host, Leonie Ross, a warm welcome to this evening's panel discussion, presented, of course, by the Royal Society of Literature in partnership with the British Library. The next hour is this wonderful opportunity to explore, decipher and interrogate the incomparable mischief and imagination of the writer Lewis Carroll. And as Molly said, we look forward to audience questions at the end. So I'd like to begin by introducing our really fine panel of guests. Uh, Patrice Lawrence's debut novel, Orange Boy, won the Waterstones Book Prize for Older Readers and the YA Book Prize, and was shortlisted for the Costa Children's Award. Her second novel, Indigo Donut, won the Crime Fest Best Crime Fiction for Young Adults Award and was shortlisted for the YA Book Prize. This year, she won the inaugural Jalak Prize for Children and Young People for Eight Pieces of Silver, which also won the Crime Fest Best Crime Fiction for Young Adults Award. Lawrence was given an MBE in the Queen's Honour List. She is the first writer ambassador for the Young People's Creative Writing Charity, First Story. Patrice contributed the story Roll of Honour to Macmillan's 2019 collection Return to Wonderland, uh, which tells children's stories reimagining Wonderland without Alice. Chris Rydell, OBE Welcome, is an illustrator, author, and political cartoonist for The Observer. He has enjoyed great acclaim for his books for children, which have won a number of major prizes, including the prestigious Silip Kane Greenaway Medal, an unprecedented three-time show-off, and the Costa Book Award. Chris was the 2015-2017 Children's Laureate, and in 2019, he was awarded an OBE for services to children's literature. Chris has illustrated new editions of both Alice novels in 2020 and 2021. In the spirit of Carol's The Red Queen Believing Impossible Things Before Breakfast, Chris will be simultaneously chatting and sketching this evening, drawing the panel live in the style of John Tenniel, who I've mispronounced again, and Chris has already told me off once this evening, um, that illustrator's original Alice. Uh, we hope that Chris will give us a sneak peek at the very end of the event. 
Our final guest almost needs no introduction. Joyce Carol Oates is a novelist, critic, playwright, poet, and author of short stories, one of America's most respected literary figures. She's written some of the most enduring fiction of our time, including We Were the Mulvaney's, Blonde, and the recently released novel Breathe. She's the Roger S. Berlin Distinguished Professor of Humanities at Princeton University and a recipient of the National Book Award and the Penn Malamud Award for Excellence in Short Fiction. In The Lost Landscape, her 2015 memoir, Joyce identifies Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass as inspiring not only much of her enthusiasm for writing, but also her, quote, sense of the world as an indecipherable, essentially absurd, but fascinating spectacle, about which it's reasonable to exclaim with Alice, curiouser and curiouser. So, hello, Patrice, Chris, and Joyce. Let us slip through the looking glass and begin. I was personally about eight when my father bought me Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, and it delighted me. And a few months ago, I reignited that delight at the Victoria and Albert's present Alice exhibition in London. I mean, I literally skipped through it, guys, grinning with actually Arenas and Okoje, who I went with. Uh, it brought back all of these wonderful memories. And of course, Wonderland's been with us for what feels like forever. And whether it is the first Matrix, Matrix movie referencing it, or the ballets and the other books and the, the paintings that it has inspired, I'd like to start with the broadest of questions for you all, um, suggested, of course, by the provocative title of the event. So when and why did you decide that Lewis Carroll was great? Why does the work abide? Patrice, can I start with you as a writer for children? When and why? Yeah. I think, in a sense, it never did. I never thought about it because it was always there. Um, I discovered Alice in Wonderland by myself and all the books that I come to love and stick in my head are books that I discover for myself. So they're in a library or a primary school library on a friend shelf and you take them. And I think with Alice in Wonderland, it obviously just sat in my head and percolated and percolated and percolated. And for me, I think what was so great was it just felt very anarchic compared to a lot of the books that I'd read at that time. So a lot of the books I read as a child um, were sort of turn of the century, the late 19th century, early 20th century books, you know, Little Women and Wooden of Willis. And a lot of them had quite sort of um, a very strong moral compass, shall we say. They were quite reactionary. They're great fun. But this was like something that, in a sense, you could almost write in primary school because then they did this and then they did this. You don't know what's going to happen next. And I think actually rereading it as an adult, it feels like it's everything that's in my brain at the same time. So I think that's why it really sticks with me as a book that I can reread because it just goes against all the things that a children's book was supposed to be at that time and to some degree still is. Joyce, my feeling is that you would agree at least with some of this, the sense of mischief, the sense of um, possibility within, within uh, uh, the work. When yes, did you uh, come? yes, absolutely. That sense of it being like an anarchic world and so different really in contrast to the adult world. Just rereading re through, looking through the book this morning, I was struck by so many passages in which Alice, who's only seven years old, supposedly, Alice just stands up against the adults with great uh, certitude. She'll, like the Red Queen says, off with his head, off with her head. And Alice says, nonsense. And I think when I first read that as a little girl of about nine, I had never even thought of being skeptical or judging adults in my family or in the world. So this was astonishingly revolutionary. And I think that Lewis Carroll himself, of course that's not his name, Charles Dodson, I think that in writing this amazing book, he had really unleashed the child anarchist in himself. And he's looking at Victorian society from a, a very marginal and very skeptical and, and very um, maybe derisive perspective. He's not one of the adults of the Victorian world. He's not an Oxford professor, 
when he's writing as Lewis Carroll. He's writing as this revolutionary voice, which attaches itself to, so well to, to the child's perspective. So it unleashes, it almost as if it unleashes the sense of uh, childlike glee within him as well and his sense of, of pushing against adults. Yes, I think so. Rather than being cowed and terrified by adults who have so much power, I mean, literally adults tower over us when we're children, they're much larger than we are. Alice is just this amazing voice. So when I was nine years old, growing up on a farm in upstate New York, I had, of course, never experienced anything like this in my life. To me, adults were, were sacrosanct. You know, one didn't question an adult, let alone have the vocabulary to say nonsense. Exactly. But since then, I think I've just completely absorbed it. And it became, <laughs> sort of became my sense of the, the, the way the world is constituted. It is basically absurd, and one should be skeptical. Chris, do you relate to this sense of uh, either, as Patrice says, a connection, but that came later and was almost organic? I, I think that's right. And but and Joyce also having quite a, a, a clearly strong response to this, and then this stays with her for a very long time throughout her life. Yes, How do you explore and find uh, Lewis Carroll's work. Well, I I first encountered. Um, uh, Lewis Carroll, um, and I think we should make a sort of um, a, a pact between us. We're going to either call him Charles Dodson or Lewis Carroll. I think we should sort of decide. I, let's say Lewis Carroll. Um, Lewis Carroll. I first encountered I first encountered Lewis Carroll um, as as a child. Um, the book was read to me by uh, as a bedtime story, and I was captivated by the illustrations. So as I listened to this extraordinary world unfold, and, and both um, Patrice and Joyce have, have talked about that, the impression that, that the, the, the prose uh, made on them, and it, it made a similar impression on me, but I was also drawn to the extraordinary pictures, um, uh, the illustrations of, of John Tenniel, and particularly uh, the White Rabbit, which was the frontispiece at the very beginning of the book, looking at his pocket watch on, on the banks of the river, being very late for an important date. Why and was that I the image, sort of Chris? Do you know why that was the well, image as a kid, the White Rabbit? I think because it was so wonderfully realistic and yet stylized. Joyce has just shown the beautiful tenure illustration isn't that wonderful mm -hmm. this is my rather sort of poor imitation but I obsessively copied that uh, frontispiece um, and I drew it over and over again because I wanted to analyze the the, the way that Tenniel managed to characterize the rabbit and yet at the same time imbue this this uh, this animal with a sense of a Victorian gentleman I mean it was a fascinating exercise for uh, um, uh, a young sort of uh, appreciator of, of, of drawings and illustration. But I also had this sense of the book as being indivisible, that, that this book was the book. There was not Lewis Carroll and John Tenniel, there was simply the book. Mm -hmm. And it was only a little while later when I was older, I realized that there was a job called uh, illustrating and that there was someone brought in to illustrate someone else's imagination. And that captivated me. And I thought, when I grow up, that's what I want to do. I, I want to be that person, just like John Tenniel, who illustrates a writer's work. And I think the way that words and pictures work within the, the book, I think, is, is, is wonderful and, and was groundbreaking, I, I would argue, for its time. Mm. I mean, we can. I, I certainly would like to tease out some ideas around, around the groundbreaking because I think for me and for a lot of people, um, in in rereading the work again as an adult, I reread it in my twenties, and then I reread it, of course, recently in preparation for this, and I was struck again how our collective consciousness, I don't think, can separate ourselves from the Tenniel um, illustrations and our sense of what Alice is, and also who. Um, Lewis Carroll is. It's it's almost as if 
more like than, than any book that I can think of, and I'm sure you can all think of an equivalent, but I can't. There is this, you think of it and you immediately think of what Alice looks like and you think of what the rabbit looks like and you have Tweedledum and Tweedledee in your head and you have um, Humpty Dumpty and the Red Queen. And so it is this it's astonishingly visual experience. I'm curious as to, uh, I mean, you seem to have really suggested this anyway, Chris, but do you think that the book could have been what it was without the illustration, the interplay between between the illustration and the words? That's a very hard question to answer because I think what, what I think we still respond to in, in Alice is, is the, its genesis in a sense, which, which you feel when you read the book. Um, it was a story told to three children on a picnic and they enjoyed it so much. It was made up. Charles Dodson, I'm breaking my own rules, Lewis Carroll uh, had sisters, uh, many sisters, and he was the storyteller in the family. He used to entertain his sisters by telling stories. And uh, as a young Don, he did the same uh, with the little sisters on a picnic, told them this wonderful story. And you get that conversational sense coming through. I think Patrice has mentioned this, the, 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 the sense of, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then yes. that happened. A very clear relationship with reader. You know, we're never bounced out of yes. the we're being we're, We are being entertained. Something is being done for us. Joyce, how do you respond to uh, ideas around illustration and its relationship with the word, particularly? I mean, we are talking about Alice. We're going to get in perhaps other works a bit later, but in the Alice books. Oh, yes, it seems to be just... Um really like organic one thinks of these wonderful illustrations as part of the book but i think that in fact it wasn't it the case that lewis carroll did his own own illustrations originally and they just weren't as good isn't that right the Joyce, tenure... they, they were charming um <laughs> they were very charming they remind me of possibly edward lear which we and, and his illustrations they, they were lovely but they were by no means as as captivating i would argue or as accomplished as as tenniels it is very interesting holding us up an illustration of her jabberwocky yeah. yeah but yeah. it is it is so interesting because obviously tenniel had a, a tremendous identification with with the book these illustrations are literally remarkable. I mean, they're astonishing. The, 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 the animal figures look like people <laughs> and Alice doesn't look like a seven-year-old. It's sort of like the whole cosmology of the book is special just because of these illustrations. Mm. Patrice, I'm curious because of course you're having, as, as Chris has, the experience of of your words being made into pictures, which is not something I've experienced as a as a adult fiction writer, can you tell me some? Can you tell us something about what that feels like for it to, you know, come out of your head through your mouth through your words, and and then here is a rendition that is visual. Is it satisfying? Is it frustrating? Uh, am I oversimplifying? Uh, I don't know. I think you're overcomplicating actually for me anyway, because um, I've got no visual sense of anything. So I couldn't even, I find it very hard to imagine things visually. So I'm always really excited at the thought of somebody else doing it. But <laughs> I was just thinking, going back to the illustrations, for, for, um, certainly for Alice in Wonderland, I think perhaps they embedded themselves in my head at such an early age that nothing has lived up to it. So I've never seen the, the Disney film. Um, I saw um, the, um, uh, the, what's his name? Uh, the one who's married to Helen Bonham Carter. Uh, very yeah. headache, migraine inducing one with yeah. every British actor going, which I thought was quite awful. Um, Patrice, so had, I'm, I'm, I'm so delighted you said that because <laughs> that is my big bugbear. Johnny Depp is not my hatter, <laughs> is all I can say. There was a lot of it that wasn't my only thing. <laughs> but I think um, the only ones, I mean, Chris, I haven't seen yours yet. The only ones that came near to me were Helen Oxenberry's. When right. she did the sort of uh, like the sort of pop up one and and that, but for me, I think going back, they are totally of one. I can't imagine the book without the images. And even at the beginning, doesn't she? She talks about um, why can a sister read a book that's only conversation has got no pictures? So the book yes. has to have pictures. It was obligatory. Okay, I'm gotcha. I, I'm going to say something. I, think, I, I feel like I'm in a room full of mischief makers, so I'll say this now, and this allows us to, to I think, look. Uh, expand more into, into the overall work. So my question, I suppose, is was Carol a one hit wonder? 
So two books about the same girl in 11 years and a bit of a poem, Chris Don't Kill Me. Um, I am being facetious. Um, in 1895, then I think 30 years after the publication of the Alices, he attempted a comeback that he produced a kind of two volume tale of fairy siblings um, called Sylvian Bruno. And it was, I think, quite successful in its time, but I hadn't heard of it, admittedly, which makes me feel a bit sad. And contemporary critics certainly seem to pan that. Um, has anyone else here read it? Has anyone read Sylvian Bruno? Okay, so. I can't claim to have read it, but but I've certainly looked at Henry Holland's extraordinary illustrations to right, it. Right. And Henry Holland also illustrated, um, I think, Carol's other great masterpiece, which is The Hunting of the Snark. Yes. And I think that's a pretty good hit rate. If you've got two um, uh, children's books, archetypal children's books like the Alice books, and you've got Hunting of the Snark, I, th I think, you know, that that is great. And then for scholars, there's the lesser work. Yeah. I mean, uh, so I, I, for scholars, there is the lesser work. I find that interesting. Joyce, how do you feel about this idea of, of a, a man who, and we know that he was a mathematician and of course he wrote other books and, and he, he was a, a, an inventor as well. I mean, he was a prodigious uh, um, ideas man. Um, and yet this, this emphasis on, uh, we'll get to the poetry in a minute, but emphasis on the Alice's and then of course the, the accompanying poetry and then a not so successful uh, final piece. What do you think about that kind of concentration? Maybe those limits? Is he a one hit wonder? Should we, should we care? Did we want more from him? Well, I think it's sort of an unfair, unfair question because he's not, I don't think of Lewis Carroll as a writer in the sense that D.H. Lawrence was a writer or Hemingway or Faulkner. I don't think he was embarking upon a literary career. I think he was a person who was immensely inspired and excited by certain you know ideas in a, in a limited period of time and he wrote I, th I consider hunting of the snark really unique also really a work of genius so like these three works you know would would one not be quite grateful to have written one masterpiece yes. let alone uh, expect to have a whole career i i don't think it's a you know really a fair thing to say and he had another life as a you know, as an instructor, as a, a, a Dan, he was a professor at Oxford, so he was doing other things in his yeah, life. Absolutely, he had a whole life. I, I mean, I, I, I feel the need to emphasize that I asked the question out of pure mischief rather than genuinely feeling that that you know it wasn't enough. Um, it feels to me then like we can perhaps have a conversation that begins to think about. Carol's work in the context of his evident love of poetry and song. So, you know, I will never forget being being uh, small and enraptured by those words. You know, twas brillig and the, sl the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. I immediately as a kid understood that. I didn't have a problem with it. I thought it was marvelous, um, you know, the Jabberwocky. And of course, 1876 is The Hunting of the Snark, which you've mentioned. I'd love to get into the poetry now. I'd love to, uh, to consider this at a sentence level. What made this so wonderful? Why is Carol so good at this? Can we, can we interrogate his, his um, technique here? Why is he a wonderful poet? I love um, his, his sense of humour, and I think that, that goes through um, all the books, everything he wrote. Um, and, and I think it's interesting, Joyce, you mentioned, you know, the, comparing him to maybe great literary sort of um, figures. Um, and he's not that, is he? he? He is a sort of very much of his time. And yet the, the, he's also, I think, a great humorist. And that sets him apart. I think he was the sort of Douglas Adams of his age, rather than a, a, a sort of, you know, Tolstoy. You know, he, he's a very different sort of writer. And I think that's why he delights children. He delights parents who, who read the books to their children. And his humour doesn't date, which, which I think is wonderful. When it does date, it dates delightfully. It takes us back. I was in Oxford. I walked past the shop that features in Through the Looking Glass with the proprietor who was a, a sheep. I was very disappointed not to see the sheep at the counter, uh, but it, to every other respect, it looked exactly like the Tenniel illustration. It was wonderful. And you know that in a sense, he knew this. He, there, there, 
he filled his his work with with wonderful references to to things. I love the fact that in Hunting of the Snark, all the professions begin with a B. Yes. I don't know why, but but that's a lovely little word game to, to delight in. And and Joy showed us that wonderful illustration of the Jabberwocky. And and what's thrilling about that, in a sense, is it, it sort of comes straight out of the National Gallery. It comes from Uccello. It, it, it's a sort of it, old Italian master sort of uh, take on a on a, a, a dragon. Um, so unexpected in a way, and yet you know that that's exactly what Lewis Carroll would have would have wanted. Mm. But I mean, it's more it's more than the poetry's humor, of course. I'm sorry, Joyce. Go ahead. No, at the same time, he's a satirist, and he's really making fun of 19th century poetry. So he's he's a, he, at the most immediate level for children, it's a story that's very engrossing, but. If you're an adult, you, you recognize that he's making fun of Wordsworth and other people. And he's very satirical and skeptical about platitudes and piety and you know Victorian hypocrisy. That's a whole other, maybe subterranean level of the, of the book that comes through more to adults. I think one of the think, things, sorry, Patrice, go ahead. I just gonna say, I suppose there's two things really for me about, about Carol and, I suppose, and about the poetry. One, I think thinking about Alice and, Alice was an outsider, so she was in all these in Wonderland trying to make sense of the rules. And as somebody who was the first in my family to be born in the UK and growing up in a sort of very white area in, in Sussex, you're constantly trying to interpret this world and work out where you fit in and, and who you are. And I think with the poetry, uh, particularly something like Jabberwocky, I'm, my, I grew up with a stepdad who's Italian but, speak, but it speaks English fluently and a Trinidadian mum. So obviously language is used differently in our household and mm -hmm. when you go to school you're told this is the way you speak this is the way you write that's very different to so have a poem that actually had these invented words and it's actually there in a book and it's a book that you're encouraged to read it told you that language could be anything mm -hmm. and because he also makes it scan so you've got reading it you know so for, uh, when I was a child I loved writing poetry and again I think the, the sort of anarchy of those poems as well is what inspired me as a child to write little rhyming couplets with strange words and things that were brought in for my own sort of background. And, and then, Patrice, you have that wonderful part in um, Through the Looking Glass, where Humpty Dumpty um, poses as a literary critic yes. and tells yes. you definitively, because, you know, words mean what they want him, what he wants them to mean, nothing more, nothing less. Yes. And he begins to uh, deconstruct this poem very delightfully. And you know it's nonsense. Yes. Uh, Alice listens to him politely, but he doesn't know what a slithy toad is, <laughs> you know, even though he claims he does. No idea. And, and that, I think, is a, a lovely thing. And, and so you, you, you've got Humpty, I think, as one of the great sort of figures. Um, who would have thought that, that Humpty Dumpty would have such resonance um, that he would actually one day lead the Conservative Party and, uh, in fact, have Christmas parties um, sitting on his extremely sort of tottery wall um, and be describing, you know, uh, things so to, to, to Humpty and to Boris Johnson, a Christmas party means exactly what he wants it to mean, neither more nor less, um, which, you know, again, Carol is just so contemporary. Can, can I read something here? This Please is, do. When I use a word Humpty Dumpty said in rather a scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that's all. Mm, mm. I was thinking about that today. Yes, it is about he who tells the story and has control of it, how you in interpret particular language and what value you bring to it. And Humpty has, you know, choral the language. He says, it will be what I mean it to be today. I am the master today. Absolutely. Molly, I, I just want to sort of interject a, a, another sort of scholarly note here. And, and, I, uh, and Joyce, if you can sort of um, maybe sort of cite this um, in, in Through the Looking Glass, there is a sequel to Through the Looking Glass that unfortunately was never written. Um, and, it, um, and Humpty is at the heart of this. Um, later on in Through the Looking Glass, he turns up at the, uh, at the White Queen's Palace and he demands to, to, to uh, see the hippopotamus. 
and the White Queen says there's no, you know, hippopotamus here. It's a Tuesday, um, <laughs> and uh, and Alice says, is there usually a hippopotamus there? And and the White Queen says, you know, uh, only on Thursdays. Um, so I want to know, you know, who the Thursday hippopotamus is. Mm -hmm. And what Humpty's business was with the Thursday hippopotamus. And besides anything else, it would make a great title for a novel, Patrice. I'm just saying, if you want to write um, a great sort of Lewis Carroll sort of, uh, hippo. tribute, uh, Thursday's hippopotamus. Thank yes, you. <laughs> is, is this true, Joyce, that, that there was uh, these were the ideas? Uh, do you, can you cite the source as, as Chris requests? I mean later on in the book? No, I'm, I'm leafing through it, but I I haven't prepared that. So no, no, this um no, this this uh, idea that there would be a sequel and that and that it would it would make Humpty the um the protagonist, which is what I'm understanding. You're saying, Chris, where have you where where, where have you gotten this information from? I'm just intrigued because of course I think we do we do we not all imagine what another okay. Alice. Um, yeah, well, it, it, all I can say, actually, Molly, is it, it comes from the White Queen herself. Mm -hmm. She's very unreliable. I mean, apart from anything else, her hairstyle is such a mess. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she has really sort of blow away hair that, that Alice has got to sort of pin up uh, from time to time. Um, so this is all conjecture, you see, from, from the White Queen. So it could be utter nonsense. But then isn't that what Carol is so good at? And I think the Thursday hippopotamus is someone I want to know more about. He is has one mention in uh, in through the looking glass right at the end just before the big the climactic uh, oh yes uh, now i remember this in, yes. in the party um and we don't see him but but yeah. i was fortunate when to illustrate uh, through the looking glass over 300 pages mm -hmm. so i had lots and lots of room to draw all the things that obviously uh, Tenniel didn't have a chance to. So I feel I, I sort of had an unfair advantage to sort of uh, maybe delve into some of the lesser sort of uh, uh, imagined parts of the books. I mean, Patrice, one of the things you had a chance to do in the collection that you wrote your story for was to be among people who were imagining, you know, Wonderland into the future, grabbing those ideas that you would love to extrapolate and, you know, explore yourself. And you wrote a wonderful story um, in which you uh, were getting concerned with the croquet game. Is there, do, do other people here, Joyce or Patrice, have feelings about what more you wanted from the work? If you were to write more uh, work um, that was inspired by this, or have you done so? I think for me, there was just so many secondary characters. I can't see I've got my flamingo earrings on today, just to celebrate. <laughs> But um, it was interesting with that because when, when we got asked to write, there's quite a few authors contributed to the anthology. And they said, you know, you need to get your characters in there, you know, make your stake for your characters. So I think people went for Tweedledee and, and for the Caterpillar. And my daughter, who obviously knows me so well, said to me like, mum, you're going to do the flamingos, aren't you? Said, well, actually, no, I'm doing the hedgehogs. How did you know? How did you know? I think I'm just always really fascinated in secondary characters. Mm. So I kind of wanted to, you, you want to know about the old man and all these, their backstories and who they are and their sort of roles in Wonderland in the same way. I don't know if Jesus Christ Superstar kind of like was told from Judas's point of view. And I just think there's just so many perspectives looking into things. So for me, it's always those secondary, smaller characters. Oh, you always think, so why are you doing that? So how did you get there? Mm, let me think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you know, um, Patrice, that that the flamingos originally in the original manuscript were ostriches? No. Uh, which would have been very different, and I think it might have been Tenniel who just said, "Look, I prefer flamingos. Thank you very much." <laughs> Are you illustrated, Joyce? Is there anything that you would want to see more of to imagine for yourself to pick up secondary characters or? third level characters even and, and explore and discover them? Well, if I were to write anything about Lewis Carroll, I would probably imagine him near the end of his life in a very realistic fashion, like where he's living and what thoughts he has. And, and he re-encounters Alice Liddell, who's now you know an adult woman and maybe she's married and so forth. I would, I would take the whole idea of the phantasmagoria that belonged to the child the childhood experience was so wonderful. And I would transpose it to real life, like middle age and, and re realism, psychological realism. And I would find that very poignant. I mean, I would have to work it out to see how it would be, but I wouldn't revisit 
the Wonderland world, I would go Joy, to- Joyce, I, I would love to read that um, because <laughs> in 1891, um, Charles Dawson had tea in his rooms at Christchurch with the, uh, the, the Alice Little, now married, um, and they, they had a very poignant sort of tea together. And I would have loved to know what their conversation was. And perhaps you could write this. Well, it sounds fascinating. I mean, that, that is the sort of thing that would interest me. But, uh, you know, the writing is the execution of an idea. The concept is very easy. <laughs> but the, the actual, <laughs> actual execution would be very challenging. But I think I, it, would, it would turn out to be rather poignant. I'm particularly interested in what happens, particularly because the book, in for me, my, and my reading of it, particularly in my adult reading of it, is it is so about the body, you know, whether it is that people are writhing, growing, um, you know, uh, uh, um, there's an opportunity to have that spatial relationship with adults uh, or, or adults in, in quotes, because of course everyone in, in the book feels as if they're an adult to, to Alice's child. Um, everybody moving and so present in their bodies, fighting and the cook throwing stuff at the Duchess's baby and so on. Molly, I, I, I agree with, with that. Um, I'm particularly interested, however, in um, how... Uh, how Alice's body would have been in her middle age. But I'm sorry, go ahead, Chris. It, it depends. It depends what cake she was eating at the time. Um, <laughs> you know, that would have a dramatic effect and what she had just, what in an advised bottle she had picked up with and not read the correct labeling. But um, I think certainly uh, Wonderland is, as you say, a, a book all about sort of um, uh, the size of, of, of things, proportion. Mm -hmm. um, and very much rooted in the body. And then uh, Through the Looking Glass, I think, is very much a, a, about language and about what words can mean. Um, and I love the, the, the counterpart. I would be very interested to, to know from, from Patrice and, and, and Joyce, which of the Alice books they prefer, if indeed they do prefer one to the other. Great question. Can I just, can I just first ask, sort of, Leone, what would you... If you could write something inspired by Wonderland or, or any of Lewis Carroll's works, what would that be? What would you take? Well, um, dare I say, I, I, I think I'm about to. And so I don't want to talk about it oh. in that kind of embryonic way, but I do think I'm about to. But it, it is based in the body. Um, Leone, can, yes, can I... Can I just interject okay. at this point? I've been calling you Molly for the wrong reason because I'm That's looking at the right, wrong. My thing. <laughs> You're very kind. Um, I'm I'm going to try and put this right by uh, um, actually sort of amending the uh, the drawing I've done of you. Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> make it uh, more beautiful, please, to make uh, up. For... But here, here we yes. are. This this is uh, Leone. <laughs> Patrice, as you were saying, um, I'm, I'm going to be very boring here and I, I can't even extrapolate as much as, as Joyce did because I'm, I'm a little worried and it's at that embryonic stage. But yes, it is, it is to do with the body because I do think one of the things I enjoy about Alice, uh, and I must say this as, again as an adult, not so much as a child, is, is the body diversity. You know, there feels to me very little judgment in the book. You have a body, whether you've got a Griffin's body or a Jabberwocky, you know, a Jabberwocky's body or a Duchess's body. There are big, small, you know, every, and, and Alice, it feels to me like her body changes and responds to the environment around her. And she takes in sustenance and has relationships with people around her. And then her body changes as a result. And it's about her body being efficient, no? Uh, you know, that she needs to, to fit into a small space or she needs to get bigger to do a thing, or she wants to have a conversation with the caterpillar and be three inches tall in order to facilitate that. And I love the idea that the body is once again returned to as this efficiency rather than, you know, what has taken us over, I feel, in the 21st century, was this obsession with bodies only looking a particular way. Well, I think so, also, this is a, George, please go way, ahead. a way of the, ch the child's negotiations with the adults around her, she is constantly, she's small, and she's, she's getting larger and smaller, and she constantly has to deal with the series of adventures that she's having, now, to you, the body and the physical, I guess, are in the foreground. But to me, I, I think that it's a, a contest of wills. Who is an authority? Mm -hmm. So at the end of 
Alice in Wonderland. She says, why? You're just a, you're just a pack of cards. And she sort of throws out these cards up in the air. In other words, the adult world, the hierarchy of power is re all these institutions, you know, like the monarchy or the, the church and so forth. They're really just a pack of cards and a child or one of us can just say that. And also at the end of, the, of through the looking glass, she just pulls the tablecloth and everything goes flying. And she then she wakes up from this nightmare. So to me, it's negotiating who is in authority and who will have control over us. And the individual saying, you are just a pack of cards or you, you just don't exist. Yeah, she always returns to her power and she always pushes against um, irrational yeah. behavior or, or, or uh, you know, lack of kindness as well. You know, she insists- This, um, this took me- way. This took me back, you know, when I was asked to illustrate um, uh, Alice in Wonderland. And the, the great thing about being asked to illustrate Alice in Wonderland is that common law demands the publisher lets you do uh, through the looking glass as well. It's just one of those things. Um, so I knew I, I had a good deal here, you know. And so uh, I went back to the uh, Charles Dodson's photographs of the uh, little sisters, uh, the three of them. And, and that gives a wonderful sort of, uh, insight, I think, t into the three girls who listen to the story for the very first time. And Alice is flanked in the photographs by her, her younger sister and her older sister, who look like the absolute sort of uh, picture of, of uh, little sort of Victorian uh, girls, you know, with ringlets and, 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 you know, crinoline. And Alice stands out because she has, Alice Little has a sort of uh, bobbed haircut, very different to her two sisters. She's already standing out as someone very idiosyncratic and very sort of, you know, full. And you can imagine in a sense that this is what Charles Dodson put into the story. It's in fact why Alice is the heroine rather than one or other of her sisters or in fact all three. Um, and I think uh, coming back to that, much as I love the tenial um, uh, Alice, the, the little blonde girl, in my version, I wanted to, to bring back the yeah, actual book. Alice, um, the, the, the original Alice, the, 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 the child who heard the story. And in fact, that's become an archetype, I think, for many, many children's authors. Um, the idea of first you tell your story to a child and then maybe you write down that story once you've had the response. I'd be interesting, Patrice, do, do you read your stories to, did you read your stories to your children? Did you test your, your, your work out, as it were? No, I've only got one daughter, I think, actually, you met who's a teenager who doesn't read my books, which I'm very grateful <laughs> because she'd probably charge me money from all the bits of her life that I've stolen. Um, I just think I just love, I mean, I love children's books anyway, um, and I used to read a lot to her when she was little. Um, and I just think I've still got that head. And I was thinking about, I re recently wrote um, a short story for an anthology called Happy Here, which was written by black authors. And I think it must have absolutely been inspired by Alice in Wonderland. Because uh, whereas in Alice um, Through the Looking Glass, you've got Humpty Dumpty, I've got a mixture of the Greek mythical character Sisyphus, I've got a Nancy, I've got Meghan Markle. And I just think, you know, you can just bring all these different anarchical characters together in a story. And that must definitely have come from reading um, uh, Alice in Wonderland and I do but also just think it's, it's you can't these days as a children's author get away with that style that Lewis Carroll has that sort of conversational style I think publishers want a very specific structure with a beginning a middle and an end a specific way of doing uh, of, of dialogue a specific way of, of presenting children you couldn't get away with some of the things that happen in a, in a smoking caterpillar would definitely be out so uh, I think no, no, the... no, Patrice, please uh, don't listen to publishers. That, you know, <laughs> honestly, um, and that I have to eat, a... Chris. I have to eat, yeah. so you know that <laughs> wasn't a, a smoking caterpillar. I think you'll find it was a vaping caterpillar. Vaping? This oh, yeah, is okay. just <laughs> how contemporary you know Lewis Carroll is. <laughs> um, can I go back to the question, Chris, that you asked, Joyce? If you had to make a, what's your favourite between the two, Alice's? Um, is there a favor? Is that possible to, to even choose? Well, the two books really are, are investigations into the same thing. We're sort of going into the unconscious, into the world of, of um, beyond the ego or beyond language. So through the down the rabbit hole is really analogous to through the looking glass. Of course. I like I like the idea of through the looking glass a little more. It's it seems more visual 
And you said, see the illustration of Alice climbing through the mirror. And we all have a sort of fantasy when we're children of the mirror world. And some of us as writers are always exploring the alter egos and, you know, doppelgangers and so forth. I'm so pleased, Joyce, you said that. I, I knew as soon as I saw you that I, I liked you. Um, because for me, you know, I'm with you on this, I'm a looking glass uh, uh, fan. Why are you looking and, glass? And I'm a looking glass fan. Uh, because um, I absolutely uh, love the poetry of Looking Glass. So it has the greatest poems in it. it, it not only does it have the Jabberwocky um, and the Warris and the Carpenter, it, it has the wonderful sort of Old Man on a Gate, uh, which mm -hmm. is a particularly sort of uh, ludicrous one. And, and of, of course, a lovely sort of um, Humpty Dumpty even is a poet in, in, in Looking Glass as well. Uh, so it has that wonderful sort of playfulness of, of language. I, I did actually um, say, Leonie, I wanted to sort of reveal my, my theory on the hunting of the snark. Um, for, forgive me if I, I, I sort of uh, uh, talk about this. For me, the baker in the crew that goes on this extraordinary hunt for, for the, the snark, this, this poor sort of flightless bird in, in, in my interpretation. Um, uh, it's a crew full of um, professions, barristers and bartenders and, and all sorts. And, and the baker joins very late. And the baker has actually mysteriously lost all his luggage. So there's no labels, there's no identifying the thing. You, you, so, and and uh, he appears, um, and he appears not to actually know how to bake. So I think there's a question mark as to his, his competency in, in his profession. And, and my theory is, in fact, um, he is uh, one of these great Victorian characters who, um, you know, a, a young lady who decided she might want to join the Indian Army, so sort of puts on men's clothes and joins the Indian Army, and many years later, as a surgeon, is revealed to have been a, a woman all along. I think that's what the baker is. Mm. I think she has uh, joined this all-male crew, uh, put on a false beard, and gone on the snark hunt. And she is the one who actually finds the, the snark who turns out to be the boojum. And they disappear. At that. This is a spoiler alert. They disappear at the end of the, the uh, poem, uh, never to be seen again. And my theory is, in fact, that this is a love story. And the baker and the <laughs> boojum fall in love. Right. And they end their days on a tropical island, a little bit like the walrus and the carpenter, sort of living happily ever after. But, this, but isn't this one of the, the most wonderful things about Lewis Carroll and, and what he does? We, the ability for us to extrapolate, for us to make up ideas as a result of it, for us to, you know, have ideas of what this thing is about generation to generation, you know? Um, I think that is one of the things about his work that I think leaves me genuinely breathless. He lends himself to every generation that we have seen to interpret, to say that this is about drugs or this is about body or this, is, and, and to imagine the stories that take place in the background. Can we account for this technically? I mean, we're all writers. How is he doing this? How is he managing to remain so apt for generation to generation? This is not a mystery. We must be able to, to or it is, we must be able to solve it. How is he managing to hold our imagination generation to generation and lend himself to what is relevant, whether it is the politics of the day or the way that we feel about ourselves as a community or as individuals? Long question. How is he well, making himself remain relevant technically? What's he doing? But isn't that typical of any great classic writer that they are contemporary with their own time, but also with our time? Yeah. That they See, resonate I, forever? I just think that it's because there's just so much in it, so much crammed in it. So you can interpret it as a literal, you can interpret it as analogies, you can interpret it all different ways. You can for me, um, I'm not visual, but I can sort of see the stories, I think probably through the illustrations. And I think because it is just so crammed full of so much, there will be something that people will, will take out of it. Well, it's sure. also worth remembering that, that um, Alice in Wonderland and then, then um, sort of a few years later through the looking glass became an industry and yeah. that um, Charles Dodson was very interested in that side of, of it, merchandising, 
turning out little sort of uh, Alice uh, memorabilia and all sorts of sort of ways in which he could then sort of stoke this this phenomenon. And in a sense, he was the sort of J.K. Rowling of his day, uh, in a sense. You know, he it was monetized to an extraordinary uh, extent. It's an excellent point, Chris, and that continues to today, that there's money to be made in in between these pages. But Joyce, I'm sorry, you were going to say something in response to this idea of... Um, well, well, one of the things that Lewis Carroll is doing, as again, a sort of subterranean, I don't think most children would be aware of it, he's, he's, he's dealing with the exciting intellectual issues of the day, like Darwinian evolutionary theory, in contrast to, you know, the didacticism of the church, you know, are human beings more like animals? Are we all evolving? Or in this case, maybe some of these characters are devolving, but are we sort of on a continuum with the animals or are we some special creation? It's clear that Lewis Carroll was more sympathetic with the idea of questioning the uh, received ideas of the day. He was, he was skeptical and he was, as Patrice said, a, a kind of an anarchist. And of course, he he has the wonderful Caucus race, doesn't he? Which yes. uh, has got its sort of Darwinian <laughs> sort of quality, and he puts himself right at the heart of the Caucus race because he is the dodo, yes, Charles Dodson, dodo. nicknamed yeah. Dodo, uh, and he has his friend Duckworth, who is a duck in in the in the Caucus race. So you have this lovely, lovely thing, and you also have, I think, to to go into maybe some Freudian analysis. Alice attempts to enter Wonderland through a tiny doorway. She can't get through. She's too big. She looks through into this lovely garden. It looks like the quad in Christchurch. Um, she can't get, gain entrance to, to this lovely place. She actually gets into Wonderland mm. through a lake of her own tears, mm. um, which is a wonderful you know, method of, of, of arriving. And she arrives on the shore drenched with this mouse who has she's, she's encountered and meets all these other sort of Darwinian animals around the place. And they're dripping wet, they're cold. Uh, she is soaked by her own tears. And the mouse decides that they need to get dry. So what he does is he tells them a really, really dry really story, story. <laughs> about <laughs> Anglo-Saxon bishops and, and, and kings and stuff to try and dry them out. Now, I think that is at the heart of what Carol does so magically. He plays with ideas, but it's always so wonderfully playful. I have a question, and I don't know, the, I actually don't know the answer. Uh, did Lewis Carroll do much revising when he prepared the, the uh, I, I assume that the story was written very quickly, very quickly, it seems to be written in a kind of white heat or he made it up and so forth. But you know, when, when we're moving toward publication, we do get galleys and there's a period of time where we can revise and change things. So my question is, did he revise much before it was published? It's an interesting question, Joyce. I think, I think you know, I'm not a scholar and there will be scholarly people who will be able to tell you, you know, yeah. what particular passages made it. For instance, the ostriches didn't make it. They were replaced by flamingos. Um, I think there might have been a few other sort of um, uh, changes, not least because Tenniel was the senior of, of, of this partnership as when it began. He was a rather grand um, political cartoonist, which is another reason why I rather love and identify with him, because my other job is as a political cartoonist for a, for a newspaper. Um, and the uh, the idea of revision, actually, Tenniel, you know, laid down the law with something, said he was not going to draw a wasp, which was originally in Through the, look, in Through the Looking Glass. He just simply didn't feel like it. He didn't want to draw the wasp. So the wasp it was a wasp from the story. Originally? The a, wasp, a wasp in a wig. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and, and Tenniel didn't draw the gnat either. Yeah. Yeah, um, I felt it was beholden on me to draw the gnat just for sort of, you know, <laughs> completism. But, uh, but it's interesting how that, that was a relationship that, that sort of started with uh, this obscure Oxford Don who was lucky enough to employ a leading political cartoonist and book illustrator oh. such as John Tenniel. But the complexity of having a, rela a creative relationship, whether it is an editorial relationship or, as you say, Tenniel had the seniority here, you know, then, of course, affects the, you know, as we know, 
um, subsequent drafts because, uh, and I wonder, I don't know, there are all kinds of things, of course, that we don't know about how he felt about his work. I do know, I think there was this big rumor that um, that uh, Queen Victoria had, had insisted that he um, dedicate uh, his next book to her. And then apparently he dedicated his next book of mathematics to her. Um, as a, a, and again, doesn't that sound like him? You know, he's like, sure, I'll do it. And then did it. But, but apparently he insists, ne- you know, such a thing never happened. Um, and the dedication. There's, an, an, another, there's another lovely story, Leon, and I, I want to tell this for Joyce's benefit, um, that um, when the first the edition of A Wonderland came out, um, Tenniel looked at the galleys, looked at the way that it was printed. They actually printed an edition. It was quite a, quite a few of them. And he just said, no, this isn't good enough. Uh, the printing isn't good enough. Yes, I, I want this done again, you know, and, and of course they, they, they had to sort of bow to, to his demand. And so Macmillan, the Wiley sort of publisher said, okay, this obviously isn't good enough for the British public. We can't have that. So he sent all the copies to America. Ah, uh, yes, I'd heard that too. <laughs> <laughs> so the Americans got the inferior. <laughs> I think one really wonderful thing about our, our panel here is Chris's presence, because I have never discussed Alice in Wonderland in the presence of a, a visual artist. And now we're beginning to see it sort of emerges from our discussion that Lewis Carroll and Tenya are really like collaborators Mm-hmm. And that it was almost like an accident that he, that Lewis Carroll's manuscript could be attached to this already very famous and established artist. So it's almost like, well, like the Beatles getting together, you know, like something that was maybe ac- accidental. The, the lesson we should learn from this, Joyce, and, and I hope you're listening, Patrice, carefully, is that what you need for your next books is the, the talents of a top-notch British illustrator. Um, you know, if you should <laughs> Any meet one. Any particular one, Chris? Or... <laughs> well, I, 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 talk to me later, Patrice. Um, you know, always, always available. Um, but, uh, but no, it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? The way the words and pictures can work together at, at, uh, at that level and how they fuse, don't they, successfully. I'm keeping an eye on time, guys, and, and, and given that we have a, a few more minutes in this part of, of, of the evening before we move to questions, I'm, I'm wanting to invite you all, because of course I, I have my, my limits, um, uh, many they are, is there something that hasn't come up in the conversation yet that you think, no, people listening to a conversation about Lewis Carroll and his work must know this? Patrice, anything that you feel that you just want to talk about before we move? To I suppose I was just wondering about his influence on future children's writers, whether they're sort of Anarchy and Roald Dahl books or even things like the Shrek movie, which brings in, which again, it's got that different layers and slightly an anarchic world. And I'm just wondering if there are any others to just feel that that really does influence those sort of anarchic writers who make people do cruel things in children's books. Hmm. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know off the, off the top of my head, but I, I can't imagine that there are very many writers who haven't at least interrogated uh, Lewis Carroll, um, even if it's just for fun, you know? So I feel at this point, um, you know, that there is the elephant in the room. I'm not going to draw the elephant in the room, but there is one. And that is, of course, um, uh, Charles Dodson's relationship with the Little Sisters and with Alice Little herself. Um, they, uh, they met when um, uh, Charles Dodson was photographing uh, the cathedral, Christchurch Cathedral, which, which you, a good vantage point from the garden, um, of the Dean's garden. And Alice and her sisters, daughters of the Dean of Christ Church, were playing in the garden and Charles Dodson made friends with them. He was uh, standing out with his photographic equipment and they, they struck up a conversation and they subsequently met up, went on picnics with his friend Duckworth al- along the Thames. Uh, there was definitely a sort of, you know, a relationship that, that they, they developed. As a, but it's worth noting that uh, Dodson was one of a large family. He was the only son. He had, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think six sisters. And he um, 
obviously sort of, you know, had a, a, a sort of relationship with, with sort of his sisters that, that was very special. He was the storyteller, the eldest brother. Um, and so it's very easy, I think, through the prism of, of modern day sort of uh, Maurice to look at this and think, well, there's something a little bit odd about a sort of grown man and, you know, with this intense friendship with a little girl. Yes, but I know you've had, you've, you've remarked on this before, and certainly when we were talking before you did. What's your in our dying moments feeling about this, the, the elephant in the room, I suppose, which is, you know, a, a different time and yet a complexity that, that leaves some uncomfortable. But now that, uh, were you asking Patrice or me? I didn't know. Really uh, either one that who would like to chime in, Joyce, if something comes to you, please go ahead. We can go back. Oh, just, just very quickly, since Chris brought this up, and Chris probably knows a good deal about this. There's this wonderful movie that's just been released in, in America, at least. It's called The Electrical World of Lewis Wayne. And the, the illustrator and artist Lewis Wayne also was from a family of all girls. And he... Um, he, he had the kind of popular success, I think, that, that Lewis Carroll did. Do, do you see any um, parallels with Lewis Wayne? I don't know Lewis Wayne, actually, Joyce, and I'm now going to research that because it sounds absolutely oh. fascinating. A, a little oh. coda, I think, to this was, was that there was a schism uh, between uh, the Dean of Christchurch uh, and, uh, and Charles Dodson uh, in 1865, about sort of two years after the, they, they had become friends. And uh, Carol was banished from, from the sort of inner circle, as it were, it was persona non grata. And the story, you know, the rumours were that he had actually uh, proposed Proposed. to Alice. Um, And Alice was 11 and he was 32. (laughs) And I got into slightly sort of, you know, hot water sort of saying, well, this wouldn't be unusual in certain parts of rural Tennessee, but for which I, you know, shouldn't be facetious about it. But I think there was a sort of heart of their relationship, an innocence that was entirely Victorian. Um, and I don't think it, it, it really went beyond that. Um, and I think uh, we cannot know is the answer to... to yes, the... we do not know. And I think also in that period, as far as I know, several of his diaries were destroyed at the time. Um, and, and therefore, it was very hard to know from his own note and, and his own reflections. Patrice, I want you to have a last word on this matter. Um, it doesn't have to be a definitive word by any means, but I want to invite you to do that before I move to a uh, question from I'm um, just really quick, and it's one of those things that I found out very suddenly and unexpectedly in my early 20s when I was just doing some research to write an article about this in Wonderland, and I borrowed a book from the library and I read this, and it was a complete shock. So I have my doubts about the idea of Victoria innocence because I think you know but um so we will never know but it does make me feel a little bit uncomfortable I understand that there's no question that um that that the abuse of children is a real thing um, I, th- I think we we all understand that Lenny. I think it's it's and Patrice I think you make a, a very good point um I would say that as a maybe a, a last sort of word on this is that in through the looking glass um the white knight really does stand for Lewis Carroll. I think he, uh, Charles Dodson, sort of identified himself as the the White Knight. And there's a a sort of moment of reverie between Alice and the White Knight. And Alice is quite sort of uncomprehending. This is a very strange character um, who, who, you know, has just recited a poem. And the uh, Lewis Carroll says what a magical evening it, it, it was and how it would be remembered forever. But I sense a sort of disengagement from Alice from, from this. So I, I sense, you know, the, the real Alice Little probably sort of had very little truck with this rather odd, oh, eccentric too. Don. <laughs> and uh, she went her own way. Indeed, she was, she was his muse. OK, I have some questions here that I'd love to put to the panel. So let's have a look at what we have. So we have Linda asking, she says, the panel have indicated that they don't feel warmly towards some of the cinematic and post tenure illustrated versions of Carol's um, Alice books. I'm an amateur collector of Alice books and have around 50 editions. Wow, Linda, in many languages with an astonishing range of illustrative styles. I'm filled with delight with every new discovery, whether traditional or modern, including spin offs. So, do the panel in this context consider themselves to be Alice purists? Joyce, are we Alice purists? 
Oh, I can't really answer that because I don't, I don't have the context. I haven't seen all these books. Yeah. Obviously, there are expressions of different people's interpretations, and they would be interesting, and it would really just matter the degree of artistry. Kenya was a great artist, so if other people are great artists, that, that's, that's fine. I mean, personally, I don't think I'm a purist. I think I'm just expressing passion and love for the for the first editions that I saw. But I'm 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 certainly very open to all kinds of reinterpretation again because of my obsession with body diversity and so on. I you know I would be extremely happy to see other takes on this. Um, and Chris, you you can't be a purist, really. You've 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 already um you've already mixed, messed up the works. You've already reinterpreted and changed your hairstyle. So you know. I've, I've got to say, um, Lynette, that, that, that I am an absolute tenual purist. Um, for me, he is definitive. Um, so it's very sort of strange in the sense to accept a commission to re-illustrate Alice, but it's been illustrated so many times. It's become a club, uh, and I like to think of it as a tea party. And tenual is, is at one end of the, the extremely long table. And then all the illustrators, Arthur Rackham, Toe Janssen, Ralph Stedman, the, the great illustrators, the, the contemporary ones who've done this. We're all sitting at this dinner table and the latest place setting is, is for me. I'm sitting right at the end. I'm just about to start on my bread and butter, but I've joined this lovely gang and right at the head of the table is the great John Tenniel who did it all. And I couldn't interpret his Mad Hatter because he's one of my favorite characters. And so I decided I would have to invent a character completely opposite to the, the Mad Hatter and Daniel's illustration. So I made the, the Hatter a girl. Um, I make no apologies for it, it's not in the text, but I just thought she, she adds a sort of uh, an interesting contemporary element to, to my version. Trace feeling on being a purist, particularly? Oh, I'm not. No, certainly not. Um, I just think for me, perhaps it's smaller 3D sort of cinematic versions. And I think for me, because it's so, there's so much in the book and it's so unlinear and so surreal that actually putting it on a screen seems to flatten it and simplify it in a way that doesn't sort of feed into my imagination because it's all done on a screen. Whereas actually in the book, you can say, no, bring on the versions. I'm happy with the versions. But I think uh, it's because that was the first, because it's sort of a, I'm going to be so conscious I'll say this now. The 10 year versions are the first ones that I ever saw. So those are the ones that sort of seared themselves into my brain, but they bring on the others. So I'm happy. Oh, fantastic, Patrice, except for Tim Burton's movies. I think we agree <laughs> on that. They're beyond the pale. Okay, absolutely. Well, Burton for the, for the moment. So I, I have been joined by a Cheshire cat, which oddly we never got to talk about. <laughs> Let me move on to another question. Uh, she was screaming, so I had to pick her up. Um, Paul is asking, he says, I'm really enjoying this event. Which writers and novelists um, do we think have been influenced by him? So Chris has already mentioned Douglas Adams. Do we see any, any other connections that, that seem evident to us? Other work, I suppose, Paul is asking us that we see out there that's been affected by? I think Roald Dahl, I think, to some degree, possibly, I think, if you look at his children's work. Um, I, I, I would say as well, Patrice, I, I, I would say that, you know, the whole canon of, of sort of nonsense poetry, in a sense, yeah. is, is, you know, owes a huge debt um, to both um, both Carol and, and to yeah. Edward Lear, the two sort of great titans of, of the age. But there are some wonderful sort of um, uh, American sort of writers, um, Justin Norton, uh, the Phantom Tollbooth um, is, is, is one I I would say is a wonderful sort of uh, Lewis Carroll sort of uh, thing. But then I think right now, I think almost every children's book in a sense is in a way uses the Alice books as an archetype. I think it is this notion of, of how, uh, how a story might enchant uh, a reader, the way that it's focused on the reader. I think Patrice, you talked about sort of improving literature, you know, the, the, the tradition before Carol, which was, you know, this story is good for you. And then after Carol, it's this story you will enjoy. You know, it, it, it's that sort of uh, great jump. And I think we've never looked back since. Uh, a question from Janet. She says, why is it that Alice is a bit Marmite? <laughs> I adored both books as a child and very much went with the flow, with all the weirdness. But my mother, who was born in 1922, much nearer to the Victorian era, absolutely hated it and obviously found it very unsettling. I think my perhaps that was the point. Uh, so what is it that some children um, love, but uh, others really don't? I think she means 
why is it that some uh, uh, some children love a thing but others really don't? What happens? It's like uh, Alice could be never tell, uh, wasn't it? I think so. She could be, you know, the thought that you could read a book where a child is rude and um, pushes back against adults was just not a dumb thing. So the, for a child reading it, when you can't do that yourself, is actually you've got your avatar and can do all the things that you want to do. So, I mean, I would never imagine talking back to my parents or my mum or any of those things. But actually, to have a character that can do for that was incredibly cathartic. It, but it's the ab- Ch- children, it's the though, Leonie. Of, of, um, it's at the, absolutely the joy of uh, the bright child, you know, who gets to talk back. Chris, go ahead. No, I disagree, Leonie. Uh, children it's- are awkward, rather repellent beings. Um, and it's <laughs> the great sort of, you know, sadness in a sense and, and, and burden that we bear. Um, Patrice and I, is that we work in children's books, so we've got to put up with them. Whereas Joyce is so lucky, in a sense, to to be beyond that and be a proper sort of, you know, academic and literary writer. Um, Joyce, you don't have to put up with these impudent and impertinent children in your signing cues. Well, I I actually have written some children's books, and mine are all about kittens and cats. (laughs) Oh, that sounds excellent. But I wanted to say one thing. Didn't Alice Liddell herself say about the Lewis, about the, the books that they would quote, the stupidest story ever? <laughs> <laughs> yes, she did, actually. I found uh, that quote too. Yes. Which is hilarious because she was the great muse. And at the same time, she, she had this very skeptical, a very uh, sort of self determined opinion, like they were stupid, even though they're dedicated to her. Well, it and sounds isn't like that a, a very Alice thing to say? Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. It's a very Alice thing to say. And as you say, um, you know, children and, and their complexities, Chris, I'm not going to join you there. Bandit <laughs> Queen, which is a wonderful name to have, is asking us a question. Uh, she says, given that the story is actually a complex mathematical problem, do does the panel or do you know anyone who has ever solved the problem or have any of the panel solved the equation now in this way bandit queen i'm not quite sure if there's a specific equation you mean or the the entirety of a narrative equation um but she says given that the story is actually a complex mathematical problem do you know anyone who's ever solved the problem but the two stories which book does she mean uh let's perhaps start with the first and i'm calling uh, bandit queen a she but i don't know that they're a she um the first, the second, we could we could theorize, perhaps. I, I mean, I don't experience them as thus, as a kind of uh, singular mathematical equation, but perhaps that's because um, my brother doesn't I, I do, Leonie, and, and in it, fact, I've actually, uh, I think my forthcoming book is going to reveal it. it, it it's called The Lewis Carroll Code, and it, it's it's a you're thriller. Quite obsessed. You do know this, right? <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's a thriller. I'm I'm hoping Tom Hanks might play the principal character, um, and and it's basically how um, we discover that Humpty Dumpty is in fact ruling Great Britain as we speak. <laughs> I, I can't disagree with this. Uh, Patrice, any feelings about a kind of, uh, I'm, I hope that I'm interpreting your question correctly, Bandit Queen, that the story is actually a complex mathematical problem. Do we have an answer to it? I, all I can say, it has never occurred to me, but my mind wouldn't think that way anyway. <laughs> well, this, well, Enjoy. So the looking glasses of chess game. Yes. That's pretty obvious. So. I mean, if, if, if it was revealed somehow, and of course this is entirely impossible, uh, that, um, uh, that the author himself intended it to all to be a singular mathematical equation, uh, Bandit Queen, if you know this to be true, please somehow send the RSL <laughs> message so that we know the answer, because I suspect that you do, so we might want to know <laughs> it as well. Now, I am aware of the time. Uh, gentlemen and ladies, you have been fabulous. I think we could sit here all night and talk about um, uh, Lewis Carroll and the complexities of his work and, and the gift that it has really given the world. Um, but I do want to thank you all very much indeed for being here, for being so open and generous with your time and to invite Molly Rosenberg back to say goodbye so thank you but before I do that Chris I know of course that we've been looking at your work all the way through um, but I'm told by the techie experts that are behind us all mysteriously that we can now see some so if you can bring up the ones that you are you love let us see them 
Uh -huh. Well, in answer to our final question, which yes. I think might have appeared in a, in a pop song, um, the uh, Dormouse, I think, probably knows the theory and can solve it. He right. told the wonderful story at the, dinner, at the tea party of the three children in, in the treacle well. Um, so, you know, I think the Dormouse knows, the Dormouse knows something. Knows. Okay. Um, here is the, the, the white knight who, um, you know, sort of Lewis Carroll identifies with, but in fact, I think looks, in my imagination, very much like the great Sir John Tenniel, um, who had the most fantastic Victorian moustache and was actually partially sighted in one eye, which is an extraordinary thing. Um, uh, this is my version of the, uh, the hatter with, with the dormouse and, and, and the hair in, in, in the background. Um, a Jabberwocky, I, I was just thrilled to draw because Joyce had shown us the wonderful original. Um, and my theory of the, uh, the baker in Hunting of the Snark, uh, living happily ever after with the boojum. Patrice, I hope you're taking notes because I want you to write books about all these things. Um, uh, Joyce, um, forgive me for, for drawing you um, in a slightly sort of Emily Dickinson style, I, I would say. Um, uh, this is my version of, 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 of Alice with the dark hair, which seems to have been going down very well in Italy, I think, um, I think mainly for the colouring. Um, and of course, my, my inspiration was the, uh, uh, the white rabbit, um, you know, a childhood inspiration. And here we have uh, uh, <laughs> Boris Humpty Dumpty, just, just to sort of, you know, end on a ridiculous note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much for that. They are wonderful, Chris. Patrice Lawrence, uh, Joyce Carol Oates. Chris Rydell, you are magnificent, and I thank you so much for your time. Uh, Molly Rosenberg will have you say goodbye. Thank you so much, Leone. Uh, thank you so much, Joyce and Patrice and Chris. And thank you all so much for joining us for the last RSL event of 2021. Uh, I want to give my thanks. I'm endlessly thanking people this evening. Uh, I want to give my thanks though too to our longtime event partners, the British Library, particularly John Fawcett and B. Rowlett for all, our, all of their work um, and to tonight's producers, Unique Media, especially John Stetheridge and Becky Godley. While tonight is the last event for this year, uh, you can tune in to the RSL social media channels next week for the exciting announcement of our February events. Uh, I think there are a few that you won't want to miss. I'll say no more. Um, as a member of the RSL, you get free tickets to all our events in person and online, uh, as well as our quarterly newspaper, Our Mutual Friend and our annual magazine, RSL Review. Or uh, if you just want to join our events online, you can register for an RSL digital events pass for free tickets to all of our online events. Membership starts at £40 a year and a digital events pass is yours for £25. Sign up today through the RSL website, which is rsliterature.org, uh, and you'll get priority access to our events when they open for booking next week. If you're listening to this and thinking, I already am a member, or I already have a digital events pass, why not give the gift of literature to your loved ones through a gift membership, which you can get today online and feel very pleased with yourself for being prepared and having your presence sorted early. Uh, for the literature lover in your life, the only thing that could possibly be as good as an RSL membership is books. So if you haven't already bought our speakers books, there's still time to do so, I think through the British Library, uh, if you use the button. Uh, I can't think of a better way to thank our speakers for sharing their time and insights with us this evening, other than uh, to say another thank you to them once again from all of us. I hope that everyone watching uh, has a very good and a very safe festive season. And until next year, good night. <laughs>